Hello and welcome to the webinar on mastitis in first lactation organic dairy cows. I'd like to welcome today's presenters. Felipe Pena Mosca is going to be presenting the webinar. He is a PhD candidate and research assistant in the Department of Veterinary Population Medicine at the University of Minnesota. And he is going to be joined by Noel Noyes and Luciano Caixeta of the University of Minnesota, along with Vinicius Machado of Texas Tech University. They are all collaborators on a NIFA OREI funded research project called the Open Community Research for Organic Animal Microbiome Education and Research, also known by the shorter name of Open Roamer. You can find out more about that project on their website at eorganic.info slash openromer. So with that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Felipe. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks, Alice, for the introduction. Today, we will present some interesting results from a project that we performed in the last three years. And this presentation will be focused on mastitis in first lactation organic dairy cows. First of all, I consider it important to define mastitis. So what is mastitis? Mastitis is the inflammation of the mammary gland that usually stems from an infection. And this infection is referred as an intramammary infection. And basically what happens is that a microorganism that is usually bacteria invades the mammary gland through a teeth canal and colonizes the mammary tissue. The presence of this microorganism is then recognized by the immune system and triggers an inflammatory response. Mastitis has two different presentations. The first one is what we call clinical mastitis, and is recognized by the presence of abnormal milk, such as milk clots, watery milk, and or changes in milk hormone. This can also present with signs of local inflammation, such as swollen mammary quarters, and in severe cases, also general symptoms, such as fever, reduced or dry matter intake, or even the death of the animal. On the other hand, subclinical mastitis is defined solely by the presence of high somatosome count, which are basically an increasing number of immune cells in milk. Mastitis is an important disease for the dairy industry due to important economic losses associated to it, such as a reduction in milk production, reproductive efficiency, and longevity in dairy farms. Mastitis also affects animal welfare because it's a painful disease for dairy cows. And lastly, mastitis compromises the milk quality since it is related to changes in milk composition such as a reduced milk solids and an increasing potential risk of having contaminants in milk, such as bacterial toxins or antibiotics if they are used for mastitis control. In order to go deeper into mastitis epidemiology and the factors that can lead to mastitis, I wanted to use this graphical representation in which the amount of water represents the proportion of cows or quarters with intramammary infections. And there will be some factors that will lead to a higher incidence of new cases of intramural infections. And we also have management tools to control them, such as maintaining the cows in a clean, dry, and comfortable environment to reduce the bacterial load in the environment, having an adequate nutrition that fulfills the requirements from the cows, having a good milking routine, having a good maintenance of the milking machine, and the use of our security and segregation measures to prevent the spread of contagious pathogens within a dairy farm and also across dairy farms. At the same time, other factor that has a big impact on the prevalence or the proportion of cows that are infected is what is called the persistence of intramural infections. So how much time the cows remain infected? And we also have some ways of dealing with this. For instance, we could sell or cows that have chronic intramural infections, and in this way they would reduce the proportion of infected animals. At the same time, some microorganisms will tend to have a high spontaneous cure, which means that they will be eliminated by the mammary gland, regardless of whether we do something or not. And lastly, in some cases, we may decide to use antibiotics, either a dry off, dry cow therapy, or lactation, which is called lactation therapy. Unfortunately, antibiotics cannot be used to, mastitis, to control mastitis on organic dairy farms, due to organic regulations. And this imposes additional challenges for controlling mastitis. At the same time, mastitis pathogens have a divergent adaptation to the mammary gland. For instance, some of them tend to be more environmental and they are less adapted to the mammary gland. 
such as E. coli. And on the other hand, we have other microorganisms that are well adapted to the mammary gland, and they tend to persist in the mammary gland for long periods if they remain untreated, such as Staphylococcus and Streptogalactin. And for this reason, these microorganisms represent a potential issue for organic dailies. And in fact, the prevalence of Staphylococcus, an important mastitis pathogen, highly adapted to the mammary gland, have been reported to be higher in organic compared to conventional dairy farms in multiple observational studies. And to support this, it, I will show now some data that was generated as part of this project by Leticia Fernandez, a master student that worked with Dr. Vinicius Machado from two organic dairy farms in the south of the United States. On the y-axis is represented the somatic cell count linear score, and on the x-axis, the different months of lactation. Then with black color, I represented those cows that had high somatic cell count in the first month after calving, and with red color, cows with high somatic cell count in the first month after calving. Cows that had high somatic cell count in the first month after calving, they also have higher somatic cell count throughout the lactation. And, and it's also interesting to see that they not only have higher somatic cell count throughout the lactation, but also they had higher somatic cell count in the previous lactation. And this just says, such as that somatic cell count can remain high for long periods, and once the cows have it, it usually just doesn't go down again. And again, this agrees with the epidemiology of those pathogens that are highly adapted to the mammary gland. And to show more data to support this, in this slide, I'm going to present some results from this project as well, in which we enroll around 500 organic dairy heifers in early lactation and we sample them repeatedly in the first five weeks after calving. On the y-axis are represented the different bacterial groups, and the x-axis the proportion of infections caused by these microorganisms that were classified as persistent, meaning that they were found repeatedly in milk samples from a given animal. Agreeing with previous report from conventional dairy farms, um, Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus promotionis, and Staphylococcus species showed a high persistence in the mammary gland. In case of Staphylococcus, 87% of the infections were classified as persistent. For Staphylococcus, this percentage was 70%. And for the strep species, it was 44% of the infections that were deemed as persistent. However, the prevalence of microorganisms, even those that were well adapted to the mammary gland, was different across different dairy farms. For example, in panel A, we can see a Staphylococcus in which almost half of the cows of the cows on farm E had an infection during the follow-up period. But none of the cows have an infection caused by Staphylococcus in farm D during the follow-up period. A similar pattern can be evidenced for other microorganisms, except for staph chromogenes. All of the above suggests that there are other measure factors that may be leading to those differences between different farms. And as a matter of fact, we enroll different, different types of organic dairies in which some of them were small dairies, while others were larger dairy farms. Farms were also located in different US regions. We have farms from the south of the United States, such as Texas and New Mexico, also farms from Colorado and farms from Minnesota. And lastly, all of them have access to pasture, but the complementary housing system was different for different herds. So we may feel tempted of making inferences from these different characteristics from the different farms. However, this study was not designed to investigate herd level risk factors since we only have five organic dairy farms. Therefore, this is something that should be further investigated in future studies. But we do have some information about cow level risk factors that were associated with the presence of intrahormone infections in the first week after calving. For example, body condition score is widely used as a tool to evaluate the amount of body reserve of dairy cows. In our study, we found that the cows that have a body condition score above 3.5 have a higher risk of intrahormone infections compared to the cows with a body condition score of 3.25 or 3.5. Other edema is also a common condition in heifers during the transition period. And we also investigate the association be between the presence of other edema and presence of intrahormone infections in the first week after calving. And we found that the heifers that had other edema had 13.4% higher risk of having an intrahormone infection in the first week after calving. Lastly, another risk factor that we investigated was association between 
presence of milk leakage in the first week after Calvin and presence of an intramural infection in the first week after Calvin. And we found that the heifers that had milk leakage in the first week after Calvin had a higher risk of having an intramural infection compared to the cows that did not have milk leakage. So we are showing some data of which two groups of animals may be at a higher risk of having intramural infection. But the next question is, is when these cows acquired the intramural infection, and we do have data to figure out this from a project. In this slide on the y-axis is represented the different bacterial groups that we found during the follow-up period. And there on the x-axis, the proportion of intramural infections that they were already present on the first week after Calvin, meaning that they were likely to be acquired before Calvin. And as we can see, for some of these microorganisms, such as Staph aureus, Streptococcus species, and Staph chromogenes, almost 75% of the infections were already present at Calvin. And this suggests that prepartum management should be considered for mastitis control on organically reared heifers. And when I was doing my literal, literal review for this presentation, I found this study that was performed by Bradley Haynes that is also involved in our project. And what they did was they randomly assigned heifers um, to two groups. One that was a control group in which there was no intervention, and then a treatment group in which they weekly apply an 1% iodine solution to the teats during the close-up period. And what they found was that the cows that were treated have a 15% lower prevalence of staph aureus at Calvin. At the same time, it also has additional advantages such as making the heifers more used to go into a milking parlor so they were less likely to kick. So I believe that this is something that will, should be considered for management and I, I think it's a very interesting result. In the first part of the presentation, I was talking about the potential risk factor and the distribution of different microorganisms leading to intramural infections. But now I will move forward to the association between having an intramural infection and the impact that this can have on the somatic cell count or the subclinical mastitis during the lactation. On these slides represented on the first column, the different taxonomic groups that we found in the study. Then on the next column, the risk of having a so high somatic cell count in those cows that have an intramural infection by a given pathogen. On the next column, the risk of having high somatic cell count for those cows that didn't have an intramural infection by a pathogen. And lastly, the hazard ratio from a regression model that is a way of assessing the association between the presence of an intramural infection and high somatic cell count, also accounting for potential confounding variables or other variables, and even for farm. And what we found was that Certain microorganisms such as staph aureus and staph species were related to an increased risk of new hysomatic cell count. For instance, the risk of having hysomatic cell count in the cows that had an infection caused by staph aureus was 85%, and the risk of having hysomatic cell count in the cows that did not have an infection caused by, caused by staph aureus was 45%. And the hazard ratio assessing this association was 3.45. A similar result was found for a strep species in which the hazard ratio was 2.25, suggesting again an increased risk of new hysomatic cell count or subclinical mastitis during the lactation. For non rs staff, we found that the hazards of hysomatic cell count was higher in the cows that had non rs staff on the first month of lactation compared to those that did not have this bacterial organism. But this association was different by the different species leading to intramural infections and by the days in milk. In case of staph chromogenes, a negative association was found in the first three months of lactation, and afterwards, the risk of high somatic cell count increased in response to its presence. And lastly, for either species from this group that were not staph chromogenes, we found that the risk of high somatic cell count was 1.45 times in cows that have an infection, compared to those that did not have an infection. We found no association between the presence of straight black organisms organ negative bacteria on the, on the presence of high somatic cell count throughout the lactation. As we can see, the hazards of new high somatic cell count was 1.19 times in cows with strep like organisms compared to those without strep like organisms, while the presence of gram negative bacteria was related to a 1.14 times the hazards of high somatic cell count compared to those without gram negative bacteria. And lastly, the presence of Corinebacterium and or Bacillus species was related to a reduced hazards of new hysomatic cell count. In this slide, I will show the association between having high somatic cell count in the first month after Calvin and the milk production throughout the lactation. I consider this is important because it's 
basically affecting the economically viability from a dairy farm. As we can see, those cows that have, did not have high somatic cell count that are represented with yellow had a higher milk production throughout the lactation compared to the cows that did have high somatic cell count, which are represented with blue. On the other hand, having high somatic cell count in the first month after calving was related to a higher risk of having her rem being removed from the herd. As we can see, this difference was as much as 15% as the end of the lactation. And this can seriously affect the economic viability from a dairy farm. And we invest so much money during raising heifers, and we don't want them to leave the herd early. And this can be an important reason for investing more in mastitis. As take home messages, we found that the majority of the infectious and lactation organic heifers were already present at Calvin. We found that for this reason, preparatory management may need to be considered when implementing successful plans to control mastitis on organically reared heifers. We also found that certain groups were at higher risk of high and drama infection, such as overconditioned dairy cows, cows with other edema, and or cows with milk leakage. We also found that the staph powers and strep species were related to a moderate to high persistence in the mammary gland, and at the same time, were related to an increased risk of high somatic cell count. For this reason, we believe that the use of screening techniques and biosecurity measures may be needed to prevent the transmission of these pathogens within and across dairy farm. And lastly, but not less important, mastitis on organic dairy farms, according to our data, persisted throughout the lactation and across lactations. It impacted meat production. It also impacted the herd removal. And for this reason, we believe that the prevention is the key for successful management of mastitis on organic dairy farms. This project increased our understanding of the epidemiology of mastitis cause and microorganisms, also about the prognosis of infected quarters and decision-making on organic dairy farms. And we believe that this is especially important for organic certified dairy farms in which antibiotics are not used for control and hair level management of mastitis. I want to acknowledge from all the help from everyone in this project. It was a teamwork. There was a lot of people helping the different stages of this project. Uh, and USA, the Mosul Funding Agency. And with this, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, great, Felipe. Thank you very much. Um, we have um, we have plenty of time now for um, question and answer. So um, we have um, several experts from this project present with us as panelists. So if you have any questions about um, Felipe's work or any general questions about mastitis on organic dairy farms, feel free to type them into the Q&A box or into the chat. Carissa is asking, is there a good method um, to test for staph or strep in heifers pre-lactation? So any of you panelists um, can step in and answer. No, it's just, uh, I was just gonna say that usually the way to test for this would be uh, to collect the milk and just run a culture uh, because it's prepartum Think that would be a little uh, a little difficult right uh, so that's why like uh, my line of thinking here is like I wonder if uh, it will have to be like immediately after parturition right like to get from the colostrum I think that would be a good way to test and maybe like segregate postpartum heifers uh, if you want to do any management based on their positivity for those uh, for those uh, pathogens. Um, do you have any ideas of why overconditioning might cause an increase in mastitis? Okay. Yeah, so on that manuscript, that's one of the findings uh, that we observed. And uh, we really didn't test for those animals, whether those like overconditioned heifers were more likely to, or they actually had more uh, ketosis postpartum, we know that overconditioned cows are more likely to develop uh, hyperketonemia, which might lead to uh, some uh, immune dysfunction right after a calving, which might lead, might, they might then become more susceptible uh, to inframary infections. But 
this is just a theory. We are not really, uh, we cannot conclude on that because we did a collect data on either the immune system or their uh, ketosis status. Okay, great. Um, can you please give a little more detail on the trial with dipping teats in iodine and decreased staph or AS mastitis? <laughs> yeah, this is a study was performed in Minnesota. Um, I can share the paper as well if you want to look at more details from the study design. As far as I remember, they enrolled 37 organic dairy cows in each group and they took quarter mix samples. Um, and the cows were assigned to either the control or treatment group. And the treatment group, they were going once a week to the making parlor during the close up period. And the teeth were deep with a 1% iodine solution. Uh, the specific formulation for my solution probably can be found in the paper. I also would like to mention that there are other studies that were done before doing the same type of study. There was one that was performed in New Zealand. And we can share those studies in the, maybe with, through the chat now. That is okay. Yeah, if you could type the link in the chat, that would be helpful. I was really curious about your study on weekly dip prefresh on decreasing staph arrays. Am I thinking? Am I correct in thinking this suggests infections are more environmental than contagious? I think that's a that's a really good question, and I don't know if we can answer that question because I'm not sure if they did. There is any study that. Uh, investigated that intervention in which they do did any type of strain typing uh, of the bacteria there. Uh, but the same thing happened to our style, right? We have a lot of heifers that were infected with the staph aureus before Calvin. We may hypothesize that they are mostly environmental, but most of them were persistent. So it's kind of unclear for us where they are environmental or contagious, like what we can say from our data is that in our study, they were acquiring prepartum, but they were still persistent in the mammary gland. So they remain for a long period. So I think that, yeah. No, I think I would just say that our results in this study combined with previous results suggest that we probably need um, more targeted epidemiological studies on the Staph aureus itself within these populations to understand exactly where it's coming from. And it could be more than one strain too, we don't know, right? There could be an environmental and a contagious component, but with the resolution of the data that we generated in these studies, we're not able to confidently say like where, where the staph aureus is coming from and how the heifers are getting it. And, and if it stays the same throughout the entire cycle, um, so. Okay. Um, let's see, here's a question from Ron about how fly pressure and cross-sucking of calves on heifers affects levels of mastitis, as these seem to be our biggest problems. I can take this question. I'm aware of some works in which they, they show that fly can carry stuff out and it can be a potential vector for infecting uh, dairy heifers. So they basically found that the same type of bacteria was present in the flies and in the heifers, and they kind of connect that as a potential vector. About cross sucking, I have, I have heard that repeated times that it can be a risk factor, but I haven't really found like a study to uh, support that hypothesis, uh, but it's something that it should be definitely considered. Okay, yeah, we have another similar question um, from Brooklyn here, who's the dairy manager at the NCDA Cherry Research Farm in North Carolina. Um, they're a pasture-based system and um, it says, we struggle with horn flies in the Southeast, which have been found to carry staph aureus. I do apply fly control to heifers, but I find that teeth become damaged or infected while they're young heifers. If you have any suggestions or ideas or management practices you recommend for mastitis management in young stock. Well, I think that they are hitting the big one there with just <clears throat> fly control. Uh, it's always interesting because we we always think about fly control when flies are already here and that that should be, that starts, and I'm not saying that's not what she does, and that's probably what they do. It's like you start in the net, previous fall or er, really early in the spring now when the larvae is coming out. So 
Uh, flight control is definitely a big one. And certainly um, hygiene, uh, having a, a clean pasture for those animals would be very important too. Um, okay, here's a question from Caitlin. Um, that was a great talk. Thanks, guys. I was curious how you guys chose to break out um, staph chromo Guinness, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it properly, in your analyses, was it more numbers driven or more a function of S. chromogenes acting differently biologically? I can take this question. So we found that most of the known out of staff that we found on this study were staff chromogenes. And then for other species, either the prevalence was really low, so we couldn't really make any analysis or they were just unespeciated with beans. We know that they are not the Staphylococcus, but we don't know exactly which species are there. Uh, so that was one of the reasons. And at the same time, yeah, we, we have evidence from different studies that have shown that Staph chromogenes seems to be the most common one. The one that is more other adapted is, tends to be very up to the mammary gland. At the same time, it has been related in several studies with uh, to clinic high somatic cell count or clinical mastitis. So that's another reason for grouping them as a staph chromogenes and then all the other ones together. Okay. Um, here's a question from Carissa. Um, given that staph and strep are, is contagious, could it be coming from milk fed to them as heifers? Could they be being infected as calves from adult milk? There, there's a lot of theories about it and a lot of people that think of that and there is some some reasoning for that but i have yet to see any data that show that pathway being how they're getting it uh i wouldn't like this is biology right so i wouldn't rule it out and uh, uh keep that in mind however and i think the reason we cannot really or don't have data supporting it or in favor or against it is because those are projects they are very laborious and very expensive and nobody had the the funds to to do stuff like that um but it is something so so far this is a theory or a hypothesis that has not been tested could be could be but i i i don't um i don't have a scientific uh answer or argument to defend or uh, disprove it. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a comment from Jerry about running the, them all through flyvax to control cows. I don't know if anybody has that's, a comment on the, that. <laughs> that. For the management of uh, young stock mastitis, oh, mastitis in young stock, I think that that's uh, that goes really well with the previous comments about flies. Okay. Um, hey, Alice, was, there yeah. was one question I think that was maybe missed up further in the chat, which was from Taryn Pickett about um, does mastitis stay in the affected quarter? So I'm, I wonder, like, Felipe, when you were talking about the persistence of these um, bacteria in the, in the mammary gland over those weeks, and then we also talked about how that can impact subsequent lactations, do we know about whether, like, how long are these uh, infections staying within the mammary gland? Do we we didn't look at that in our study past five weeks, um, but are there is there previous research to sort of get a sense of how long these things can be persistent within the gland? Yeah, so another point that we need to mention here is that we use composite samples in our case. So we don't really know if there are persistent infections in the same quarter or they may be in a different quarter. At the same time, we don't know if there are different strains, which will be within the same species, but maybe different types of bacteria. And, but there are some studies that have done before using strain typing techniques. And for some of these pathogens, such as Staphylococcus, they can remain for very long periods, as much as six months or so. And for a strep, usually the results are more inconsistent because it depends a lot on the strain. We have some strain of a strep that tend to be very well adapted, so they will remain for long periods. But in some cases, when they are investigating the dynamics of mastitis on a dairy farm, they see that multiple strains of a strep are affecting the cows, which also suggests that the epidemiology might be environmental in some cases. So the adaptation is more, uh, it depends on the strain a lot. 
Okay, um, we have a question here from Kina. Did you check the sanitation of the milking systems as well? Um, I'm curious to know if they may have had an impact. Unfortunately, we don't have any data on the sanitation of the milking systems. Um, yeah, but I guess it would have been interesting to, to have some information about that. But we didn't get that information from the dairy farms. Well, even if we had that information, uh, that information, perhaps we wouldn't be able to uh, uh, to make conclusions, right? So maybe we would be able to, uh, because like the milk system is the same for all the cows. Maybe we would be uh, have a better idea on whether like we're finding a high prevalence of those uh, pathogens in comparison to other studies, but we wouldn't be able, like we won't, we would not be able to implicate the, the sanitation methods because like the sanitation methods, it's applied to all the cows, right? Uh, so that's just uh, one more uh, herd management uh, feature uh, that maybe it, it would play a role, but uh, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to conclude anyway, uh, anything anyway. Okay, um, so we have another question here from Brooklyn. Um, they're not certified organic, so they do use antibiotics, um, including Spectramask, LC, and Today. Are there any successful treatments that you have found to actually cure Staph aureus? I know several treatments are labeled for them, but it never really goes away for good once it has had an active inspection infection and um, they've been able to temporarily get rid of it but it seems to always show itself again in the same quarter at some point and they typically end up culling these animals is there a successful alternative the I best think. treatment oh, i'll just give my opinion philip and then yeah. you jump in but the best if you have if you want to get rid of truly get rid of that forest in your farm uh the best way is uh to remove those animals from the herd. Uh, as even one of the farms in the study that we don't we didn't find any step for is that's how they they could manage that. Uh, yes, there is all the treatments they are labeled for um, step for us, but if you think if you even think about the data uh, Felipe presented, like we many times we don't know when that uh, infection happened. So it might be that that infection has been in there for a long time before you picked it up or have a clinical case that you uh, cultured those animals. So if if we knew how, when they were, I'm sure that the success rate with those drugs would be much better if we start treating them right when they get infected the first time. However, we usually don't. And then those infections might be in the memory gland for a long time. So be very well established there. There is some... Uh, 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 cases showing that there's some uh, biofilm formation in the memory gland, uh, and that's why the treatments cannot get rid of it, just because they go in this quiescent period where they go in there, wall themselves off, and then you put antibiotics there, but they are protected by this biofilm. That's why they flare up later. That's why when you try treating them, you treat them and you test them a couple of times every two weeks for uh, four or five times to make sure they're not coming out because they will go on and off on this uh, protected biofilm, not active infection and come back on. Um, the one thing that people have been uh, successful, somewhat successful is treating those cows that dry off and then uh, hoping that the antibiotics plus the not milking them for that dry period help them. Um, get rid of that infection, but I have not seen any very successful alternative other than antibiotics. Okay. Yeah, just, just to add up to Luciano's answer, like usually the antibiotics have little impact on the cure rate of a staph aureus. The most important factors are related to the cow, such as if the cow is an old cow, like has like three or more lactations, the cure rate will be much lower. Also, if the cow was infected for a long period, as Luciano has mentioned, is another important factor. And lastly, another factor can be if you palpate the mammary gland and you can palpate fibrosis in the mammary gland, that will be an indication of a really, really poor response to, to treatment. 
but, but there is no no good alternative for treating staph aureus. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess cooling the animal may be the most uh, the best solution in some cases. Okay, yeah, we have a related question um, from Lorenzo who wants to know what treatment should be used to treat a cow with mastitis in an organic dairy and um, what the cost is to treat a cow with mastitis on an organic dairy. Everybody's muted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so there is, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any, uh, there are some alternatives and some other treatments. So the best treatment that we usually use in conventional farms would be antibiotics, and that's not allowed in organic farms. Uh, I'm not aware, and I've seen data on some herbal products uh, that uh, people used, but I'm not convinced that they're as effective as an antibiotics, for, for example. Uh, again, there's part of the question there. Antibiotics is not allowed in the organic scenario in the U.S. Things are different in other countries. The regulations are different. And then you would be able to use it, but not in the U.S. Um, okay. And yeah, usually people are doing, what they're doing on the organic there is they'll be stripping down and milking those cows more often, try to get rid of that and decrease the amount of this milk, which would be a media where the bacteria could grow and try to get uh, rid of that infection that way. Okay, um, we have a question about um, whether there are any strategies to break down biofilm in mammary gland infections. Not proven. There is a lot of things they'll say they'll do it, uh, but there's no data behind it. So I'll say no. Um, so Kina sent a link, thank you very much, um, that some organic therapies were as effic efficacious as antibiotics used as dry cow therapy in North Carolina. And um, she sent a link to an article in the Journal of Dairy Science, but said that more data is needed. So if you're interested in that, you can click on that link and see what that study was like. And then um, Joao has a question about whether biopeptides can be used. Um, are there any studies of epic efficacy on those? I think it would depend on how they are produced. Like that, like we, I don't know. So it did depend on how those biopeptides are produced, like thinking about the molecule. Now thinking if they will work, then I, I don't know. And I haven't seen any studies on that. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's it for the question. So thanks, everybody. Um, for Thank you, Felipe, again, for giving the presentation. And thanks for everyone else for being on to answer the questions. And um, if you'd like to find out more about this project that um, is being worked on, on the Open Roamer project, um, you can find that on the eOrganic website under projects. Um, it's eOrganic.info slash Open Roamer. And um, we look forward to more webinars from this presentation before between from this group before the project is over. And um, thanks to everyone for your questions and for joining us today.